Hello, everyone. For those who don't know me, I'm Catherine Cox, and I'm a member of the With Ukrainian Unions Organising Committee. I'm still a little bit moved by that slideshow, to be honest. So thank you to everyone who contributed to that and who put that together. Um, just a few quick notices before we proceed. We're very fortunate, again, to have a volunteer team of 12 professional interpreters here today, translating into German, Spanish, French, Italian, Portuguese, and of course, Ukrainian. So please, if you've not already done so, select the language in which you would like to hear the speakers today. That includes English. The interpretation button is the globe button, which is probably along the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you can't see it, look for three small dots. So please select the correct language now. Um, and I'd like to take this opportunity on your behalf to give a heartfelt thank you to all our interpreters for supporting our Ukrainian colleagues in this way. Thank you very much. Um, and just to let you know, if you have not already noticed that the webinar is being recorded. And so a very warm welcome to you all, especially to all our Ukrainian colleagues, wherever you are joining us from. We also welcome any colleagues joining us from the people elsewhere who are defending against erasure. And today we would also like to extend a welcome to anyone affected by the terrible earthquake in Turkey and Syria. And finally, a welcome to all of you who have come today to stand in solidarity. This event would mean nothing without you. Your presence here today is key. So thank you all for coming. In a short while, Diane finiello zervas will introduce our speakers. The Q&A function will then be available. Please type any questions in English or Ukrainian. Sally Arthur and Alina Branta, our moderators, will put a selection to our speakers. Now, we're very pleased to have Diane finiello zervas as chair today. Her bio is in the flyer for today's event, so I'm not going to repeat it. I'm just going to share with you my top tip if you ever have the opportunity to attend a webinar by Diane on Jung's images in the Red Book, clear your diary and make sure you get there. Diane, as well as being an analyst, is an art historian and has conducted a lot of research and analysis. It's really quite exceptional into Jung's images, looking at the books in his library and the texts that he was studying. And, and it makes you realize there's even more depth to Jung's images than we had realized. So that's my top tip. But before Diane introduces our speakers, we would like to remember all those who have fallen or suffered in this war and elsewhere. So I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Sally Arthur, who's also a member of the organizing committee. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Catherine. Parts of Ukrainian territory were invaded by Russia years ago, but today we commemorate this week's anniversary of the large scale attack, which many of us believed would never happen. With pain and horror, we've witnessed apocalyptic scenes of destruction on our news channels. And you, our Ukrainian colleagues, are living this nightmare every day in your own country and as refugees in other places. Many of you are working with traumatized patients whilst you yourselves are suffering the horrendous trauma of war. We had all hoped that the war would be over by now, that we would already be reflecting on it as a past event. However, the fighting rages on and there is the threat of what the spring offensive will bring. The outer bombardment and struggle is matched by an inner one in which feelings of love for Russian family, colleagues, friends and neighbours oscillate with feelings of shock, hatred and despair that such acts of aggression could seemingly be tolerated. It feels as if we are looking over the edge of an abyss. There are concerns about what lies ahead. There is uncertainty about the future and we ask ourselves how to find a way to keep going. One way to find meaning and the ability to carry on is by being together. And so with you, we've built this community to sustain us in the year ahead. We first made contact with you through the IAAP network, and we went on to build relationships with you through the reading of Anne Ulanoff's paper, 
written a year ago in solidarity with the Ukrainian people. With your enthusiasm and energy to connect with us, this progressed to the reading groups and now to these webinars, the film project, the dream depository, also the Arras image project, which inspired the creation of the very moving slideshow that you just saw. Thank you to all of you who contributed to it and to Alison Tuso for putting it together for us. We continue to find new ways of supporting and learning from each other across languages, time zones and through cyberspace. We've learned from you about your history, your culture, your resilience and your strong sense of community and survival. We outside of Ukraine feel enriched by our personal relationships and friendships with you. And together we find ways with you to bear the suffering and pain. We recall Jung's words from chapter nine of Liber Novus, where he writes, let your hope, which is your highest good and highest ability lead the way and serve you as a guide in the world of darkness. Today, we remember not only the thousands who have died in this war in Ukraine and those grieving for them, but also those who've been injured, tortured, sexually violated, abducted, displaced, and separated from family. We also think of those elsewhere in the world who continue to fight for their survival and who are struggling against domination and erasure by their own powerful imperialistic neighbors. And we hold in mind the more than 50,000 people who've perished in the catastrophic earthquakes that have struck Turkey and Syria, those grieving, those injured, and those who have been made homeless. So now on this somber anniversary of the attack on Ukraine's very existence, we remember and we join together for a minute's silence. Well, good evening. It's indeed a great honor to introduce this webinar, especially as it falls so close to the first anniversary of the war in Ukraine. Under such circumstances, it is timely that tonight's theme centers on Jung's new cure of souls, or as he states in the Red Book, the task of giving birth to the old in a new time. I felt this most strongly when I met Svetlana Svechchenko, tonight's Ukrainian colleague and speaker, on Zoom a couple of weeks ago. She told me about her life in Zaporizhia, currently one of the cliff faces of the ongoing conflict, and of her determination to remain in her geographical and psychological heartland, where she serves the soul in her work with her analyzans. She has much to share about the importance of what they experience under such stressful circumstances, striving to remain united wherever they find themselves, yet deeply rooted and grounded within the temenos of Jungian therapy. 
which is both timeless and timely. In Jung's words, something ancient and something new. To ensure we could share her talk in case of disruption, she has videoed it. Thank you, Svetlana, for your concern for the souls collectively participating in tonight's webinar. Jung historian Sonu Samdasani hardly needs an introduction. He is well known to the worldwide Jungian community, and we owe him an enormous debt. His first book, Jung and the Making of Modern Psychology, The Dream of a Science, highlights Jung's pivotal role in the formation of psychology and psychotherapy in the early 20th century. And thanks to Sonu's years of scholarly research, dedicated editing, and soul work, we now have Jung's Red Book and the Black Books. Sonu has served as midwife to the birth of these old works in a new time, our present age. They provide the missing links so crucial to our understanding of Jung's psychological development and have altered the way in which historians and therapists understand Jung's fundamental principles. The Red Book teaches us that these principles are rooted in the image, the rediscovery of the soul, a renewed reverence for the dead and our acceptance of their lament and the restoration of the lower and the past through the law of love. Please join me in welcoming Sonu for his talk on Jung's new cure of soul. Thank you, Diane. I'd like to begin with a poem by the great Peruvian poet, Cesar Vallejo, who has much to teach us about surviving in such times. A man walks by with a baguette on his shoulder. Am I gonna write after that about my double? Now this sits, scratches, extracts a louse from his armpit, kills it. How dare one speak about psychoanalysis? Another has entered my chest with a stick in hand to talk then about Socrates with the doctor. A cripple passes by holding a child's hand. After that, I'm going to read Andre Breton. Ella trembles from cold, coughs, spits blood. Would it ever be possible to lead to the deep self? Now the searchers in the muck for bones, rinds. How to write after that about the infinite? A bricklayer falls from a roof, dies, and no longer eats lunch. To innovate, then, the trope, the metaphor. A merchant cheats a customer out of a gram. Speak after that about the fourth dimension. A banker falsifies his balance sheet. With what face to cry in the theater? An outcast sleeps with his foot behind his back. To speak after that to anyone about Picasso. Someone goes to a burial sobbing. How then become a member of the academy? Someone cleans a rifle in his kitchen. How dare one speak about the beyond? Someone passes by counting with his fingers. How speak of the non-self without screaming? Faced with the war in Ukraine, one asks oneself, От коли почалася війна в Україні, я собі поставив питання. Faced with the war in Ukraine, one asks oneself, how can one speak of something infinitesimally small in the make weight of the moment? 
to speak nevertheless from the poverty of my expertise is all I can offer. The idea for this presentation arose when I learned that some psychotherapists in Ukraine were concerned that the ways they found themselves working in today diverged from therapeutic norms in the Jungian field. Given this, it seemed that it would be of possible interest to reflect on this from a historical perspective. I've been interested in the question, how cultures of psychotherapeutic practices change and how these norms get established. Decades, I've been creating a portrait of Jung's practice by collecting accounts by his patients. This has been alongside work done by colleagues in Freud history, which has been very informative. We've been doing very similar work on Freud's practice. As Ernst Faltzader has shown in the Freudian world, infractions of analytic rules were actually the rule, not the exceptions. An orthodox classical training analysis turned out to have been largely mythical. And it opens up the issue of how one, these myths then function as regulative devices on practices that actually uh, escape them. In the article in New Cure of Souls, I tried to characterize some aspects of Jung's practice how it shifted following his work on the black and red books. One could ask the question, what was the modality that Jung added to psychotherapy? I'm not speaking about theories but in terms of just the practice of psychotherapy. A simple and complicated answer would be higher development. From 1913 onwards, as charted in these works, Jung commenced in a process of self-experimentation, which he termed as confrontation with the soul or confrontation with the unconscious, a term that does not appear in these books. At the heart of this project was an attempt to get to know his own myth as a solution to the mythless predicament of secular modernity. This took the form of provoking an extended series of waking fantasies in himself. He elaborated, illustrated and commented on these fantasies in Liber Novus. This new book, depicted the process through which he regained his soul and overcame the contemporary malaise of spiritual alienation. It was achieved through enabling the rebirth of a new image of God in his soul and developing a new worldview in the form of a psychological and theological cosmology, which you then spend the rest of his life trying to translate into abstract psychological language, his dream of a science. This work, presented his prototype of Jung's concept of the individuation process. The main method that Jung utilized engaging his fantasies in a waking state was what he would later call active imagination. There's been little study of what was taking place in Jung's practice during this critical period, where he attempted to develop a replicable form of psychotherapy from his own self-experimentation. In a nutshell, he took his patients along with him. It was, in many ways, a collective experiment. We first start by considering how he proceeded with his own self-experimentation, with his self-scrutiny. The first phase from 1913 to the summer of 1914 consists in this process of elaborating his active imaginations with no interpretation at all simply sometimes noting his mental states. The second phase, in the summer of 1914 onwards, was one in which he retranscribed this material, retranscribed it, and added then a section of lyrical elaboration and commentary. This commentary here could be described as an interpretation on the collective level reading the figures in his fantasies as representing dominance, psychological powers, general forms of human functioning in himself and their interaction, and trying to divine to what extent his fantasies portrayed what was to come in the world, if not in a literal, but then in a symbolic form. This undertaking led him to reconfigure his, his psychotherapeutic practice. The question of the alleviation of pathology 
or neurosis did not go away, but to the something else we added, namely higher development. Psychopathology also became reconfigured and understood in a new light as potentially containing the germs of personality development. Consequence of this expansion of the remit of psychotherapy beyond the cure of pathology was what Jung termed a move from a formerly medical method of treatment had now become a method of self-education, no longer bound to the consulting room. The psychotherapy of the individuation process for Jung could be described as a supervised descent into hell, into the underworld. In psychological terms, it consists in coming to terms with the imagination, in which a therapist played the role of a shamanic guide to the suffering and seeking patient, as someone had been to hell and back in their own terms. Critically, Jung did not interpret the active imaginations of his patients did give guidance as how to conduct them and counsel the patients ran into difficulties. The aim was not an interpretive practice. The key issue was to foster the self-healing capacity of the individual through their imagination. We see this clearly in his interchange with John Layard and his assistance that Layard learns to active imagination and not depend on him picture on uh, on my left is Layard trying to do active imagination actually in a seminar of Jung's in 1937 in this inimitable way. Jung would describe his own experiments to his patients and instruct them to follow suit. His so role was supervising them in experimenting with their own stream of images. So in this formulation the critical nexus of therapeutic transformation lay not between patient and therapist, but between the eye of the patient and their inner figures. So it was not in an, the minute analysis of transference and counter-transference relations, which I was fully aware of. The role of the therapist lay in facilitating this inner relation, if you will, in constellating the inner healer healing power of the imagination in the patient. The goal of this process was not simply one of individual development, but a collective societal development, which individuating patients would form an avant-garde elite. Regarding his clientele, Jung noted in retrospect that he had very few new cases. Most had some form of psychotherapy behind them, a third had no neurosis at all, but simply a sense of aimlessness. Two thirds were in the second half of life. He wrote, most of my patients are socially well adapted individuals, often of astounding ability. In this regard, he differentiated between minor and major psychotherapy, and was the latter, the major psychotherapy, the psychotherapy of the individuation process that it was his main concern. It was this psychotherapy that was no longer considered to be a purely individual affair. Rather, he saw it as a vehicle for wider social and cultural spiritual development. What was intended was a whole scale transformation of human relations. Psychotherapy and the psychotherapeutic circle around Jung was an experimental vehicle for this. In this regard, the formation of the Psychological Club in Zurich in 1916 played an important role. Jung described it later as an experiment in group analysis. This is where it is now, where it moved to in 1918. The aim of this enterprise for Jung was to see how analyzed individuals interacted outside analysis and with each other. The results were none too encouraging. Unlike Freud, Jung wrote no recommendations for physicians practicing psychoanalysis or analytical psychology, laying no strict rules for the practice of psychotherapy. This was not a shortcoming that needed rectification, but deliberate. For Jung, analytic attitude was not to be literalized into Freudian rules and precepts, 
was not purely a medical method of treatment. By the norms of the contemporary Jungian world, Jung's practices would have had him hauled out in front of an ethics committee, that is, if he would ever make it through the training or indeed initial interviews. To give just a few examples, Fowler McCormick, who was in analysis with Jung at the same time as his mother and his father were, recalled that Jung would carve in wood in many of his sessions in 1916 and 17. Fanny Bowditch Katz had a three hour session at a train station in 1915 whilst Jung was on military service. James Kirsch recalls that some sessions with Jung took place walking around the hills around Kuznacht. Jaime de Angulo sent his ex-wife, Kerry Baines, his dreams, which she discussed with Jung in her sessions with him, and sent Jaime back Jung's interpretations. There was a great deal of social contact outside of analysis. The English psychologist William McDougall, who went out to have analysis with Jung, uh, during the course of the, the analysis, Jung and Baines went sailing and had dinner with him. They found him very stuck in his persona and to sort of loosen the grip of his persona, they got him drunk, which they found successful. It does look a bit like in, in need of a drink to me. With many patients coming to Zurich from overseas to work with him and so being socially isolated, he asked his wife to make social calls on them between sessions. And this is how she developed her own practice as a daughter narrated to me. Seen from the norms derived from psychoanalysis, such practices would be seen as boundary breaking and breaching confidentiality. However, in historical terms, what was going on was a complete different conception of the nature and aims of psychotherapy. For Jung, the goal was to lead to a transformation of life. A new psychological honesty and openness was supposed to change social relations as part of a spiritual development. Further, a feature of Jung's practice was his use of assistants such as Maria Maltzer, Tony Wolf, and Peter Baines. He regularly referred patients to commence their work with one of his assistants before working with him. In a similar way, Kerry Baines was asked to tutor some of Jung's patients before they worked with him, so that the necessary preparation, the basics of analytical psychology. In the 1920s, individuals did not come to Jung not knowing what to expect they were selected and primed. You can't imagine something further away from Freud's injunction of patients not to read anything. The social role of the analytic patient in this context of a patient of Jung had to be created. If they had extensive personal problems to sort out, he would generally leave this to his assistants. This indicates that what ensued was the result of quite unusual procedures. In 1929, Jung explicitly described his aim as being one of bringing about a psychic state, which as patients begins to experiment with their essence. To experiment with one's essence. The willingness of a number of individuals to accept this invitation to experiment with their essence in such a manner and embrace the new conceptions this led to, convinced Jung that the latter were not merely idiosyncratic, they were replicable and had general significance. He maintained that his fantasies and those of his patients stem from the mythopoetic imagination which was missing in the present rational age. Reconnecting this could form the basis for cultural renewal. He thought that this could only come about through the self-regeneration of the individual. As he saw it, the task his patients were confronted with was recovering a sense of meaning in their life made more pressing with the secularization, rationalization of contemporary culture. Consequently, such individuals were not only healing themselves, but also the culture. Thus, the aim of the therapeutic cure was not one of helping patients adapt to existing social norms. It's the social norms that led to a loss of meaning and to neurosis, but to process, but to foster a process self-realization 
it would ultimately contribute to reshaping society itself. In such a way, we have a reversal. Psychotherapeutic patient has now become a cultural physician. How did this shift in analytical psychology? As we know, Jung was averse to the establishment of analytic trainings in the Jungian world, which developed in the 1940s. Crucially, these involved a break from the fluid but rigorous practices of Jung and his close circle, the adoption of institutional models developed in the Freudian world, first off at the Berlin Institute in the 1920s. I'll consider briefly developments in London. In 1936, the Medical Society of Analytical Psychologists, note the acronym, Medical Society of Analytical Psychologists, was formed in London. Its members were Culver Barker, H.G. Baines, Michael Fallon, Bart de Laszlo, James Kirsch, Joseph Wheelwright, Helen Shaw, and Gerhard Adler. Up to this point, a feudal structure had prevailed in the Jungian world. A Jungian practitioner was simply someone recognized and anointed by Jung and established in referral networks. Through the formation of training societies, a detachment entered in. The institutional model was borrowed directly from psychoanalysis. This alone had a determining factor on what followed, quite apart from the theoretical borrowings. Critical was the insistence that analytical psychology was a branch of a medicine requiring scientific and clinical qualifications that should be on a par with the Institute of Psychoanalysis. This was accompanied with the disenfranchisement of figures described as the para unions. In 1944, Michael Fordham wrote, there are quite a number of what, what one could call para unions, whose work we know little about and one reason for becoming a registered society is to prevail those people calling themselves analytical psychologists, sorry, is to prevent those people calling themselves analytical psychologists and so being identified with us. Out of the 50 practitioners with a Jungian orientation, only 12 were considered suitable. So we see here the development of analytical psychology doesn't actually consist in an organic expansion, but actually quite the opposite, a constriction a limitation to those with su sufficient qualifications. So in place of the feudal structure of an individual being approved directly by Jung to practice, the licensing transferred to the analytic societies. The death in 1944 of H.G. Baines also had a decisive factor. He'd been the dominant fact figure in England till then, and the only one in England whom Jung had entrusted with a copy of the Red Book. And so he's the only figure in England versed in the esoteric dimensions of Jung's work, which he didn't seek to innovate or develop, but simply to disseminate. A further important development was E.A. Bennett's appointment as a consultant psychotherapist to the Morsey Hospital, as lecturer at the Institute of Psychiatry, where he was succeeded by Robert Hobson. Bennett taught Jung's work to lectures in, post, in lectures to postgraduates, which led to an influx of psychiatrically informed and psychoanalytically trained or psychoanalytically informed and psychiatrically trained candidates. That's the Society of Analytical Psychology. Michael Fordham recalled that the trainees exerted a decisive influence on the way the society developed. As he noted, the orientation of the trainees, quote, combined with the society's clinical orientation, and increasingly to leaving on one side much that other or earlier Jungians held dear. In part, this was due to the absence of translated versions of Jung's later contributions. Also because the cases that were available for trainees to study, not of the kind which Jung had collected in Zurich, people who dreamed rich archetypal dreams and conducted active imagination. Jung's seminar reports were in short supply and so could not be conveniently referred to where it seemed desirable. What was not realized is that Jung didn't exactly find his cases by strolling down Bahnhofstrasse in Zurich. 
was part of a, a therapeutic culture that was assiduously developed. Quite candidly, Ford notes here that the trainees simply did not have much access to Jung's publications or seminars, let alone if have any inklings at all of the esoteric dimensions contained in his black and red books. So quite simply, appraisals and developments of analytical psychology were simply based on a seriously incomplete corpus and a lack of knowledge as to how Jung practiced and what he was actually on about. What took place was a shift to a transference-based model of practice. It's an increasing disappearance of active imagination, which Jung had seen as a via regia to individuation. And the therapeutic efficacy of such practices is outside my purview. It's not what I'm sort of concerned with. I'm concerned with shifts in practice and how this takes place. Late 1980s, Fordham expressed his regret to me that for many, practice of analysis was no longer a vocation. Of the SAP, he said to me, it's a monster. Look what it does to people. There are few who survive it. We now fast forward to today. With the publication of 15 volumes of Jung's unpublished works and correspondences and scholarly editions in the Philemon series, together with the Red and Black books, there has been a renewed interest in the public at large in what Jung actually said and wrote, as opposed to what has been attributed to him in a form of transcendental ventriloquism. This has brought with it an interest in what Jung was doing in his practice and in active imagination. As we speak, Jung's unpublished seminars in 1931 on active imagination in Zurich, edited by Ernst Faltzader, is about to enter production at Princeton University Press. It seems we're perhaps witnessing another shift in cultures of therapeutic practice. Thank you for your attention. in terms of understanding. Only we have the space and the ability to understand the difficulties of the planet. And maybe that's why we are here. It may, well, uh, and it might be even a moral obligation to try to understand war. And it is possible to say that in the process of reading and uh, um, thinking, I become more uh, realistic in terms about the possibility of preventing war. We have a lot of methods of dealing with the consequences of the war, but we don't have any preventive measures to prevent it, unfortunately. War, also, it is an absolute creation of human hands that can be attributed to the natural phenomena, such as hurricane, earthquake, or flood. We need to admit to ourselves that we are not able to control it. I would like to say so far, not now, and we have only one way to stop the war. It is to resist the evil. Capitulation to the demand of the unscrupulous uh, initiators of immoral actions leads uh, to the expansion of these actions to the point where further capitulation becomes impossible and victims are inevitable. And the scale of victims is far exceeds those that, sadly, 
could have been limited initially. Imagine within 5,600 years of the written history, 14,600 wars have been registered. Hillman titled one of the chapters of his book, War is Normal. Although the phrase war is normal shocks our morality and wounds our idealism, it is a statement of the fact war is becoming more and more normalized every day. And he bases his statement, war is normal, on two factors, its persistence throughout history and its ubiquity throughout the world. To, to understand war, we have to deal with the myths, to recognize that war is a mythical event, that those who are in it are in a mythical state of being that their return from it seems rationally inexplicable, and that that love of war tells about the love for gods, the gods of war, and that no other history, political, historical, sociological, psychoanalytical, cannot penetrate, which is why war remains unthinkable and inexplicable to the depths of the inhuman cruelty, horror, and tragedy, and to the heights of the mystical superhuman sublimity. It is not the enemy that is important for the war and imposes wars on us, but this is imagination. Imagination is a driving force, especially when imagination has been conditioned by the mass media, education, religion, and it's fueled by aggressive stimulation and pathetic piety because of the state's need for enemies. Enmity takes many forms. Nameless women to be raped, a fortress to be destroyed, rich houses to be looted, a monstrous predator, cannibal, or evil empire to be destroyed. The element of fantasy creates the rationality of war. Absolutely accurate description of what is happening in Ukraine now. The media pumping Russians with fantasy information and their desire to rob, rape, and destroy. I read Rick uh, Rensman's article, Watson in the Shadow, Analytical Psychology and the Architectural Roots of War. The author identifies three phases, stages, uh, the, in the Jung's vision of the archetypes of war. Jung had his own experience of living in the times of crisis. He faced the horrors of two world wars and was very concerned with this topic, the ability of humanity to find the solution to avoid repeating these horrors. He explored the roots of the war in the article, The Role of the Unconscious, later in the archetype of Watson, and then in the archetype of Shadow. We live in the 21st century, but we are faced with those manifestations, characteristics of people that you use to describe the unconscious part of our psyche, barbaric, dark, primitive, and animalistic. Although this is my personal attitude, I believe that for the Russian invaders, uh, as for all others, uh, the animalistic characterization is a compliment because animals do not create war, do not rape, do not rob, do not torture. This is the prerogative of people. Jung writes, when pushed into the unconscious, the source from which it originated, the animal in us becomes even more bestial. And this is undoubtedly the reason why no religion has been so defiled by the shedding of innocent blood as Christianity, and why the world has never seen a bloodier war than that of the Christian nations. The repressed animal bursts forth in its wildest form when it comes to the surface. And it, the process of self-destruction leads to the international suicide. The longer a certain part of this psyche has been dominating in our evolutionary history, the stronger its power will be, regardless of how much cultural baggage has been imposed on it to suppress it. Jung uses the following metaphor. A 
archetype, unlike river bird, bird beds that when that dry when the water leaves them, but which it can find any time. And the life of the individual as a member of the society, and especially as part of the state, can be regulated like a channel, but the life of the nation is a great raging river that is beyond human control in the hands of the one who has always been stronger than men. Now, I would like uh, to show you some photos. This house is in the center of my city of Zaporizhia, and it was destroyed by the Russian missiles. People died under the rubble. This photo was taken shortly after the explosion, but look here. This is a mirror, and it remained intact. And this photo was taken after the rubble has been dismantled. This mirror is the same. This mirror saw everything that happened. And now it is a kind of a symbol of indestructibility. The mirror also reflects everything that is happening around it. And it reflects it very objectively and emotionlessly. And we humans reflect this world subjectively and are always full of emotions. Each of us who is a part of this war is a kind of a mirror that reflects this war. Some separate, separate small pieces of it. But together, we create this huge picture of the fight against evil. And here is everything, courage and cowardice, loyalty and betrayal, generosity and greed, the interest and indifference, all the diversity of this life, but magnified many times over. War tends to sharpen and manifest the basic human traits. Recently, I was putting my notes in order, clarifying the number of sessions, because during the first months of the war, it was a complete chaos. I had to conduct sessions from my car, balcony, corridor, basement, boom shelter, or from the street even. And I turned to my correspondence with the clients in those days. And I confess to you that I was crying. Over time, we forget many details, and this rereading was a kind of return to those times and they were very very difficult they were horrible and they're horrible now one of my clients was nine months pregnant and she was expecting her third child another was under occupation and shelling and for a month they had no news from her several took their children abroad or to Western Ukraine and went through all this horror of cues, fears, uncertainty, and the confusion. Some were under constant shelling in basements without water and basic amenities. Some people, people's sons and husbands, went to war to the front. Some of them had six relatives in their arms and were unable to leave. There are so many stories so unique and they are all mirrors that reflect this war on the one hand full of horror and on the other hand full of strength courage and the indomitability and in my support group there is a girl who is engaged in evacuation of animals from the war zone her stories are model of dedication and courage of Ukrainian and foreign volunteers, people whose love for animals and all living things inspires to do bold things. We asked her to record these stories for a future book, and this may become another mirror reflecting the war. It's exactly what happens to my speech is it is an attempt to reflect my part of the vision of this war. What I can share with you is the peculiarities of healing the soul during the war, based more on my practice and experience. In some ways, my vision is personal and subjective, and in some way, it coincides with what many of my colleagues are experiencing. When I taught at the university, I always told my students that I would not teach them this subject in such a short time. 
So my main goal is to generate interest and desire to think about it. And now the situation is similar. I can't cover the whole topic. It's infinite. This is just a small essay. And the main thing for me is that together we can think, consider the war, even if what we see is horrible and unattractive. But it's also important not to turn into outside observers, but to have one's own position on what is going on, what's happening, to contribute, to help to fight. Neutrality can become a crime here. The hottest corners of hell are reserved for those who have remained neutral in the times of the great moral turmoil, Dante Alighieri. When we tell others about our experience, it broadens their understanding of this process, but it never conveys the way we feel it ourselves. I heard a lot about the war from my mother, read a lot and watched a lot of movies, but it does not compare to the experience I go through when I'm inside it. The worst thing for me was the beginning of the war, especially its first week. But I continued to work with the clients and groups and it was a challenge. So my special and very deep gratitude goes to my supervisors, Arthur Nisser and Brenda Krause. I would like to thank you profoundly on my behalf because when you go down to help, it is very important that someone stays there on the surface and a small part of the description of this help. The woman who sees of her husband to the front line the consequences of the shelling and raiding. And uh, this is what remains after the occupants, after the occupation, and these are our Ukrainian children. And this is the results, the consequences of uh, the occupation to and uh, the uh, Russian Federation soldiers into our country. And this is about our hopes. So my supervisors were and are my support and my guide, and they are also my mirror, because it is very important for me to understand what state I am in. If we are talking about the peculiarities of working in the times of war, I noticed that especially at first uh, that more of me stayed, uh, started appearing in the supervision session. Before moving to uh, the client's case, it was very important to scan myself because I was in the territory of trauma in which it is very easy to get lost and lose touch with oneself. So I was very extremely attentive to my dreams, my thoughts, my fantasies. In times of war, clients become very sensitive to this analyst, analyst state of mind. And in the situation of external instability, they need our internal stability. Because in the times of war, analysts are also experiencing stress, exhaustion, and as a result, the threat of emotional burnout increases. That's why it is very important for an analyst to find an opportunity to switch, stabilize, and recharge. For me, the place of the recharging became the nature, especially working on land. Uh, uh, from April to August, I was in Germany. I took my daughter and my grandchildren there, and I helped them adapt. I sometimes joke that I had dug up the whole Germany over that summer because I created for the um, for the landlady of our house all the flower beds, and I planted uh, flowers uh, in them. I walked a lot in the woods, and uh, with my grandchildren, we were building the forest wigwams. And uh, these are the photos uh, which reflect like my stay in Germany. All of this helped me to ground myself, to throw off the negative, to gain energy from Mother Earth and to create something new. Speaking of the working with the clients, but to be honest, um, I don't know who helped more uh, and who, whom I helped more. 
because whether I help my clients or they help me, because by helping our others, we help ourselves. Yes, that's true that the work has changed uh, many aspects of analytical work. At the first uh, stages, I sometimes heard that analysis was impossible during the war, but uh, the reality showed otherwise. In some cases, the analysis became even deeper. The war shook up and brought up to the service a lot of deep and painful material. And I am proud of my clients who were able a, a, to process it, to live with it, and to move on. I've also heard that analysis is impossible when the analyst is in this safe place and the analysant is in a dangerous place. I had such an experience as well. For some time, I was safe in Germany, and part of my clients were in danger in Ukraine. And the opposite experience, when now I'm in a dangerous place in Zaporizhia, and some of my clients are safe. In both cases, analysis is possible. Yes, this has its own impact, and we have to take it into account, but it does not prevent the analysis. Yes, some things are changing. For example, my clients worry about me, and I answer their questions about the situation in my city. When I came back, it was very important for me to explain to them that being here is not a heroic act not a thief, but at my conscious choice, because I am here in my place. And that's exactly what we learn from Jungian analysis, to be yourself, to make your own choices, and to follow your own paths. Hillman writes, war demands meaning, and in a strange way, it also gives meanings, meanings found in the midst of the chaos. If the peculiarity of working during the war is that a lot of questions arise. Why? For what? And we have to look for the meaning in the chaos of war, to find, lose, search again. And here we create both collective meanings for the whole nation and personal meanings that everyone finds for, them, for himself or herself. Very often, it is a very painful process to look for the meaning in death, meaning in destruction, and meaning in suffering. Jung saw in his own experience and the experience of his clients uh, that uh, people have collected dreams before and during the significant world dreams. And in my clients' dreams, there were a lot of images that warned that, that something terrible was coming. There were huge ships that were approaching and threatening to crush them. Fire trains flying at breaking snake speed, fighting enemy, various natural disasters, other destructive and dis destructive images. I would like to tell you about one of them, or rather part of it. I see a large human figure ahead of me, a man wearing a hat from which dirt is dripping down, as, as if he is made out of mud, a very large, giant, giant. Then another giant appears, a fat one. I start running away from him. He almost catches up with me. I'm on the train again. I'm traveling. The train slows down because some kind of a disaster happened ahead. It starts uh, moving slowly. I'm afraid that the truck is in fire and the train is going to get derailed and the train passes a mountain of corpses. Now I'm walking. The field and the forest around me, I realize that I am in the dream. These are the characters of my dream. They are real. Are reality and the dream the same thing? I am going to the uh, wardrobe as if some voiceover was saying, it's all illusions, illusions. I take a decision and I uh, jump down in front of the giant. I fall down, but I am, I'm don't break. The giant immediately shrank. Now I start to run after him and he's moving away with fear. I still remember the day when I heard this dream, my feeling, my horror, my premonition. But I wanted to think that it was a personal dream, that it was something about the dreamer himself, but it was about all of us. You know, I see great hope in that image at the end of the dream. 
when we have courage to approach something frightening and look at it, it stops being so terrifyingly big, shrinks and eventually disappears. I also want to tell you about my dream. My city, Zaporizhia, is located on both banks of the Dnipro River. And on the 9th of February this year, I dreamt that I saw all that the left side of the city is being bombed from uh, the right bank of the Dnipro. Explosions from one side of the city to another and lots of flame and smoke. And uh, on the 10th of February, my city was subject to the most massive attack by the Russian missiles uh, since the beginning of the war. About 20 missiles were sent. And this is another difference that appears in the work in the times of war, because in the dreams, feelings, and the state of our clients and ourselves, it is often not the personal that appears, but the collective. People are fascinated by the collective processes, and it's very important to separate them. I would like to invite you to do a little exercise in active imagination. You can close your eyes or leave them open as you prefer and now think of a personal tragedy, trauma or unpleasant situation which your other currently living through or lived through long ago, something which was very painful to you. Now you can keep your eyes closed or open the way you prefer, but look at it. What color is it? What is the size of it? What do you feel when you are looking and scrutinizing your personal problem? And now imagine the tragedy or trauma that your people have experienced the people to which you belong, the trauma which has been lived through by your people in the past or is lived through by, uh, by your people now, look at it. How, what is the color of it? What is the size of it? What are your feelings which merge when you are looking at it? And now, look again at your personal trauma. Has anything changed? Unfortunately, we would not have the opportunity to discuss this. But in most cases, our personal problems become much smaller compared to the collective ones. And this is exactly that I can see now in some of my clients, because it was the war, it was this collective trauma gave them the opportunity to see their traumas from a different perspective. This experience freedom gave them freedom and courage to realize their plans and to be themselves. But this has another side. For example, some of my clients stopped being sensitive to themselves. And they were saying, how can I think about my problems when the whole country is in such trouble? And I had to bring them back to themselves, tell them about the importance of being sensitive to what is happening to them, not to reduce the complexity of their personal situation and to take care of themselves. Because very often, this led to fatigue, irritation, depression, and other symptoms. Because each person has their own personal reserves and limitations, and it is very important to take into account. In situation of war and stress is complex, and one has to make a lot of choices. Sometimes they take unexpected and instant decisions. And in this situation, there are no right decisions. They are all wrong in some way. For example, when women went abroad with their children, they often left their parents, husbands, their relatives behind in Ukraine. And they felt that they betrayed them. 
And I think that one has to be very careful about these feelings because there is a great temptation to push this into the unconscious and say, I was saving my children. Yes, this is true. It's true. But there is another truth that they left other close people behind. And how important it was to keep both these parts in the zone of the consciousness, to be in contact with the feeling of guilt, with the feeling of betrayal and other difficult feelings, because not being aware of them, of them and pushing them out led to depression, anxiety, and self-punishment. And that people were losing the connection with other people. It was very important uh, to recognize our humanity limitations, imperfections, and be able to consciously forgive ourselves for this. I experienced a similar situation because I took my daughter and two grandchildren to Germany, while my sister, my mother, and other members of the family stayed in Ukraine. My nephew and uh, my grandchildren's father went to the front. And it was very difficult, but the ability to hold these two opposite states uh, and uh, this conflict and the paradox. On the one hand, I did a good thing that I saved my grandchildren, but on the other hand, I did not do well by leaving the part of my family in Ukraine. I have to confess, these are very complex feelings, but the result it led to unexpected decision. At a certain point, I was uh, I was inspired to create a series of webinars about the Jungian view of working with the trauma, and I started a support group. And most importantly, we freed a lot of energy to do it. The war stirred up a lot of transgenerational traumas. People who were in Germany were so telling me that they had a lot of images from their family history related to the World War II. They could not learn German. They had difficulties in ad with adaptation. But after these processes were realized, the situation changed. I told you that when I was in Germany, I worked a lot on the land and it helped me a lot. And later, I was told this story that during the Second World War, a lot of black soil was brought here to this region by railroad cars from Ukraine. And I understood that being in a foreign land, I managed to touch my native land. This is how it works. The war continues and we are gradually adapting to stress. But we need to remember that the background stress, which we sometimes uh, do not notice, uh, becomes chronic. And this is very important uh, for us analysts and for our clients. That's why we need to continue taking time to recover and take care of ourselves. Another aspect I would like to talk about is that, that in the situation of the war, a psychologist becomes more of a citizen. Psychologists cannot shy away from confronting the contemporary history, even if his soul avoids political unrest, false propaganda, and harsh, harsh speeches by the demagogues. There is no need to mention that his duty as a citizen pose a similar challenge. I said that it is very difficult to convey in words the experience we are going through now, but a song music can do it. Because the song, and especially a folk song, is the language of the soul, and our soul is crying now. We are saying goodbye to the sons and daughters of Ukraine who died in the war, to the Ukrainian melancholy folk song, Plina Kacha Potesie. When I was choosing the video to accompany this song, I came across a lot of beautiful aesthetic options, but I didn't choose them. You will see the burial of an ordinary Ukrainian man from an ordinary Ukrainian village. He was not a professional soldier. He worked in the village. He was 32. He had a wife and two children. And he went to defend Ukraine and never came back. To, to, to put it correctly, he came back. But he was killed. 
so plena pacha for this senior. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Svetlana and Sonu. And um, we're moving into questions and answers now. And I'll hand over to Olena to start with any from Ukraine. You can put your questions in the in the question and answer box, type them in and we'll summarize for you. We have one question from to the Ukrainian audience. I will read it. 
the author says, I experienced the war when I was in Luhansk Oblast in 2014, then in Kiev Oblast in Kiev region in 2022. I'm now in Europe and as an artist, I am supposed to speak about the war, but it's hard for me to keep going back, revisiting that experience. I believe my experience was not as tragic as that of other people, but still quite unpleasant to revisit. And when I reject meetings, events, artistic events, I seem to betray the country. I do not help people even as an artist. So how to get the energy, the power to speak about that? I do not see the specific addressee of that question. So I suggest that Sonia and uh, Sonu and Svetlana, maybe you could address this question if you would like to share. I believe that this is a question that is very relevant because I mentioned that in my presentation that we now witness two opposite feelings and uh, experiences and they happen simultaneously. So you should not betray yourself or this or that other part of you. As I mentioned when I shared my experience that it is possible to hold the both parts together at the same time. This is as Newton speaking about the transcendent function and then something new may appear because then if we hold that paradox, we can create something new. This is one thing. And second thing, we need to be attentive to ourselves, I guess, because in these times it often seems to us that some people experience uh, bigger trauma or greater distress but it is important to be attentive to what happens within you. You cannot do anything about the other person's sorrow and grieving, they have their own journey, but self-care, it is so important. And if we can stand or hold this paradox, that's where creativity appears. And I am so grateful, Sono, for your for the poem that you presented at the beginning of your lecture, because I guess this is what it is about. It is about the opportunity and the possibility of that next to what's happening here and now we create something new. Thank you. Oops, I have a question which I've just lost. Um, this is from Barbara Sofia Yurich Rasta. Barbara Sofia. And uh, she speaks of her gratitude that the issues of sex and the contrasexual work. Gênero no trabalho. And she speaks of her interest in sex, in questions de gênero, our perceptions and performance of the aspects that these words refer to. Que, com, com quais essas palavras se referem. She notices that there are so many more female feminine names and faces here tonight. Mais é, rostos femininos essa noite. In the same way as in the discipline therapy and other professions. And I think either of you can jump in on that one. Eu acho que cada um, qualquer um de vocês pode responder a essa pergunta. Um, I teach a course at UCL on uh, a master's course that I direct on health humanities. And 
we find on that that I would say each year at least 80 to 90 percent of the students are women and um, uh, I, I have no idea why so uh, um, it, it seems to be a phenomenon okay they seem to be more curious in in these subjects At historical level, one can look and look at the shift in in the gender profiles of um, different schools of psychotherapy. In terms of, if you're looking in, say, in the 30s and 40s, um, say so psychoanalysis was was male dominated, particularly with all kind of medical kind of establishment. Um, and but that has shifted um, quite significantly in subsequent decades. Thank you, Sonu. If I may continue, unless Svetlana, you would like to comment on that. Okay, so I see a question in the chat. Svetlana Semenova, she writes that before this event, she found out that her friend was killed at the front line. How to avoid repressing the great pain that you cannot really tolerate hold physically. And my condolences, Svetlana. Well, I believe that here uh, rituals could help, of course. The rituals that our people has developed, has formed in particular in order to go through this pain, because there is so much pain around and we often encounter the situations where we lose dear people at the front line or as a result of missile attacks or shellings. And thus it is very important to share it. Because Catherine or you, Sally, I believe you, Sally, you said that it is so important to stay together, that this is our way of going through that, of experiencing that. And this opportunity to be together, to share, it is so important. And I believe that in this situation, it is important to speak about the person who passed away, about your relationships with that person, about what happened previously in your relationships. But it is important to share. And I believe that now the entire country we feel that all of us are together. I have this feeling that every soldier at the front line is like my friend or relative, someone who is very dear to me. On Facebook, I often see photos and I try to look into the face of each of them, to see their faces, to think about their lives because we are losing so much. And that's the collective pain. And it is possible to go through that when staying together. Okay, following, following on with a, with a sort of therapeutically orientated question. There's one from um, R. Nelson about a friend in Canada who's lived in the war who wants to work on her dreams but is a bit afraid. Um, do you have recommendations for a good way to her for her to start? Svetlana.
I think that there is no one particular way to do that. But of course, we are now working a lot on that in our practice because our clients see a lot of dreams about the war, about actual hostilities or some symbolic dreams. And I believe that the first thing here is the opportunity or the capacity to just speak about that. And this is not about deep interpretation or going really deep exploring that, but just about verbalizing, speaking up, facing that, that courage. I mentioned in my contribution that in my client's dream, there is this short episode where he dares and jumps down the wardrobe in front of the monster and the monster uh, sh shrank. I believe this is about that because Jung said that sometimes you just need to take notes of your dreams, discuss your dreams, make drawings, and that's already a way to work on dreams. I would start there and then depending on how your friend responds to that, if they have enough energy to go further, of course, it would be possible to go deeper. But sometimes this deep exploration, discussion can already be, just sharing can be therapeutic. Because for me, dreams are above all about feelings, not about images or stories, plot lines. They are about the feelings and about the capacity, the possibility to share those with the other. Thank you. Thank you, Svetlana. Anything to add, Sonia? Um, no. Okay, just going back to the, the male-female, um, Artemis Papert has commented that Perhaps the imbalance comes from typology and has read a statistic that 80% of feeling types are female and 80% of thinking types are male. And I noticed someone's hand is raised. Is it possible to put your questions in the Q&A because Elena and I are focusing on that in order to manage the quantity of questions? Um, if not, put a message in the chat and we'll try and get back to you. Um, there's another question, Elena, can I go? Um, from Patricia Preisner, how do you, as someone who's directly affected by the war, this is for Svetlana, I guess, think about someone who's safe and secure, but still want to talk about it, make others be aware of, want to create art, poems, etc. about this. Would you say this is okay for someone who's not directly affected, but full of sympathy? How should we, as someone outside, express it without being pretentious? I think that we are very, very different, uh, and we need uh, different uh, empathy and compassion to ourselves. But I think that if one understands that someone is standing by you, it is already sufficient uh, sometimes, because some people just need uh, to be heard and to be listened to, and the opportunity to be um, uh, um, to be to be by this individual and it's a very important to actually listen to the stories which are being told by the others and sometimes people cannot endure the difficulty of listening to this and i think that we can manifest our empathy while we are close to the person close to the individual and listen to him or her and to give some space for this purpose Or maybe simply say, we are here, I'm here, I hear you, I listen to you, I'm next to you, I'm by your side. Or maybe 
it is possible to ask the question. It works, and the individual will tell what he or she needs. We do not have questions from the Ukrainian audience, and I would like to use this opportunity to add my own comments to uh, this Ivana's speech. And I wanted to comment this section where she was talking about the mirror which survived in the destroyed house. And uh, there is a belief in Ukraine that the mirror consumes all the energies uh, which is witnessed by this mirror. The positive and the negative energy is uh, being absorbed by the mirror. When I was listening to your answer, Svetlana, I thought that if each of us has a mirror inside ourselves, which is witnessing our own life, it is very important to see someone who is at your side, next to you, the person who is alive, and who can help you to include this grief which has been which has filled our souls and to add some positive feelings. We have a question. Miss Ludmila is asking what one should do when everything who is next to you, including the therapist, I can not really endure my feeling of grief and are trying to alienate themselves from me. Just one question. To answer it, we have to know more about the situation you are in. But I think that your therapist and the people who are around you are not the only people on this planet. There are lots of other people around you. And you have to look for them. You have, and you should not be afraid. And you should not rely on your unpleasant experience, but you should move forward, continue moving forward. And I think you will always be able to find people who will be able to share your grief with you and be able to endure it. Unfortunately, this situation is quite common in our country. Everybody is stressful. And this, in Ukraine, people confront their private own problems, personal problems and experiences. And they are unable to find room for the sufferings of the others. So I've mentioned already that it is very important to have someone who is standing by you. And for me, these were my supervisors, the people who share this container with me, who are capable of, of, of taking up part of uh, the awful things which my clients bring into my life. So I think each of us has to find such a place and such an individual who is able to um, accept us, who is able to identify time and place to be to, together with us. So look for such an individual, but these people really exist. Sonia, would you like to add something? Uh, not to that. I'm not a clinician. Then I'm going to read the next question from the Ukrainian audience. Uh, this is Oksana Bayer. Uh, good evening. I would like to thank you very much for an excellent lecture. And my question is the following. Uh, why there are some expectations that, that if an individual is capable of uh, withstand uh, difficult, ambivalent feelings, it becomes the source of energy and uh, 
actually uh, gives an opportunity to be creative. How do you uh, explain it? And I love today's event and actually the language you're speaking as uh, uh, really very, uh, very uh, well, uh, good. I explain it by the said in function because the opportunity to withstand the, the tension between the uh, opposite feelings or trends uh, which exist inside of us. So this transcendent function is uh, deepened into the unconscious and brings from there a sort of symbol, the image and energy, which helps us to find unstandard solution, something new. And for me, this uh, is about the feelings I had. Now, this ambivalency and the tension which I experienced, they uh, really deepened into my unconscious and all of a sudden brought the decision which I never expected. And uh, this is what I did. And uh, this has happened to me. And uh, Jung is uh, telling uh, uh, the similar story. And this is, I'm, I'm trying to simplify uh, the answer because this is not a lecture on the transcendent function, but nevertheless, I would like to uh, share my opinion. This is the way it works. There is another question. And this is a question from Alexei Miotelsky. Uh, if, uh, sorry if I uh, uh, did not pronounce your name correctly. The question is the following. What is the maximum uh, uh, holiness uh, between the men and the women during in, in the times of war? Well, which, which word did you want to use? The, the, uh, maybe, maybe you wanted to use a different word? This is a question to the person who wrote the question in the chat. I, to be frank, I did not understand the essence of this question. Whether these are, this is a question about the values or about the, uh, the what was, what is going to be the maximum, um, well, unity of between men and women during the war. Alexei? Can you maybe specify your question and maybe a little uh, expand it a little bit so that we can understand the essence of this question? And while Alexei is reacting, I would like to go back to the question about the transcendent function, about the opportunity to hold. And, but this is also about the shadow, but uh, you know that our shadows uh, contain a lot of energy. And when we are uh, working on the shadow aspects, and quite often these feelings are shady, uh, these feelings are shady aspects. So a lot of energy is being uh, freed, and our creative potential is uh, uh, being uh, freed. Uh, Ms. Majuri Ranyan is uh, raising her hand for the second time. Uh, Sally, maybe we can listen to the question. And I've asked her to type the question. Yeah, I've asked her to type it because we uh, um, yeah, are uh, unmuting people. Um, does anyone else have a question while we uh, get access to Marjorie's? Miss Alexia liberated on this question. How oh, the individual is creating the space of holiness for during the time of war. Yes, Vitana has heard the question. I am thinking how this space could be created. I'm just thinking over it again. 
this will depend on where the man and where the woman is uh, located. If we are thinking of the situation when the man is in the front and the woman is uh, is uh, waiting for him to come uh, safe, so maybe it is possible to create the image internally actually to have the internal image of uh, the partner which actually complements your holiness because the situations are very different i'm thinking about it a lot because uh, the uh, the the there will be a lot of uh, you know cases which will be um, of cases of trauma, which will be discussed after the war. Uh, well, uh, the people who have been in the front line will bring their own traumas, but there are men who are trying to avoid going to the front line. And this is their pain, and this is the pain of their women, because that's very complex. Because, and that's why each situation is individual, it, it is not replicable. And we cannot talk in general about these cases. But if we would be talking about the men in the front line and the women who are waiting for them, I would suggest that we will be thinking about this internal image, which I keep with me. And thus we are feeling the connection between this man and the woman. And maybe this gives an opportunity to survive these difficult times. And uh, well, while feeling the presence of the other. And it was a symbolic presence, but nevertheless, it will be the presence. And thank you, Oksana, for the answer to the previous question. And we also have another question well, uh, from Kira. Oksana, thank you very much for a very profound uh, feeling of the symbols. And actually, I uh, recall the image of the mirror as the mirror of invincibility. And uh, this is also a symbol of, uh, of fragility. And uh, this mirror uh, remained whole, undestroyed, and actually it was hanging on the wall, which was not destroyed. And what is this supportive wall for us in Ukraine? How could you comment the symbol of that wall, uh, which uh, is uh, bearing all the weight of the building? For me, this is our Ukrainian identity, first of all. And uh, this is the wall on which we can rely. And uh, this is our wish to preserve our Ukrainian identity, language, country. And this is a huge force. And I believe that all of us feel this force now because our unity is unique and it is unreplicable. And it is uh, possible just to see and feel it around us. Uh, to what extent people can be together, support each other. And for me, this is for me, this is exactly this wall, this bearing wall. And Mira really is is sim is a very important symbol, which is full of everything. It's a symbol of. Uh, you know, transition from one world to another world. And actually the mirror has a lot of magical aspects. And I think that this is a very interesting symbol. Thank you, Svetlana. There are more questions, but I think Diane is about to interrupt us as there was. Yeah. Well, unfortunately we um, need to think about closing this very rich seminar and I therefore would really like to thank and on behalf of everyone who's been here with this uh, to thank Sonu and Svetlana for their really richly stimulating and reflective talks and for the questions that were taken up in the following discussion. There's so much for us to contemplate and absorb. Thank you both very much. And I would just like to remind us, and most of you may already be aware, that our With Ukrainian Union speakers give freely and generously of their time to nourish us um, as an international community, as we've seen. Uh, if you do not already, if you have not already done so, could I please encourage you 
to make a specific donation for tonight's seminar. All proceeds go to help us, to help that is to say our Ukrainian colleagues and links to the donation site are on the, fl the flyer and tonight's Zoom chat. So thank you again, Sonu and Svetlana, and I'll have back over now to Catherine. Thank you very much, Diane. And, um, and I just echo your thanks of our speakers and everyone who's participated. The mirror was indeed a very striking image and um, I was very struck as well by reference to the collective. And of course, um, we as the Jungian community are also a collective and what does the mirror hold up to us as we're on webinar two of, I think it's 16 webinars and the journey that um, together we're going to be taken, taking over the next few months and what work do we need to do looking in the mirror? Um, it raises some very thought provoking questions. So I would like to thank everyone who has made the event today possible. Um, I'd like to thank the analyst from the UK who sponsored the event and to everyone who gave so generously of their time in planning and running the event, because that too is sponsorship. Um, I'd like to single out today two people in particular, because sadly there isn't time to thank everyone by name. The first is Claire Mouchot, a member of GAP, who um, has now returned to live in her native France. Claire puts in a phenomenal amount of work um, behind the scenes to make sure that everything happens. And without her, I don't know where we would be. So a massive thank you to you, Claire. Um, and the other person I would like to mention in this webinar is to thank Marilyn Matthew from BJA in the UK. Marilyn designed our flyers. Um, I think they're a real labor of love. For me, the warmth of the colors, the attractiveness of the design, help to create the container in which WUJ tries as best as we can to hold our colleagues suffering from such relentless trauma. Um, so please join me in thanking Marilyn as well for the gift of her creativity and her patience with WUJ, me in particular that is, when we work on the flyers. They're very fiddly and time consuming. Over the next two weeks, you will receive two flyers. The first will be for the third webinar in the series, which is Marion Dunley and Elena Brante, who you've seen this evening, who will be holding a webinar entitled Body Dreaming, Aligning with the Body and Psyche's Inherent Organic Capacity for Self-Regulation. This is where Jungian psychology meets the body and neuroscience. Whether you already work with the body in your practice or whether the idea makes you want to run for the hills, this webinar is for you. I've attended Marion's workshops before and they're a very safe environment, they're calming, they're practical, and they're also somehow wonderfully take, take one into the depths. Please note that that webinar will be on Saturday, the 25th of March, starting at 1700 GMT. So it's an earlier start and it's our only Saturday webinar. And the second flyer that you will receive will be our bumper summer edition. It is 36 pages long, which will include information on webinars four to seven. Lionel Corbett, Murray Stein, Susan Schwartz and Anne Shearer. So please do look out for it and keep it handy. And so everyone, that brings this webinar to a close. To our Ukrainian colleagues, we pray that you and your families will stay safe, stay safe until we meet again next month. To all our other colleagues and friends, thank you very much for coming, for being part of this container and for showing your solidarity. Um, and for those of you who've got two more minutes to spend, um, we are going to play the prayer for Ukraine. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone.
Thank you and goodbye.